So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Blasopoulos. I'm um, uh, one of the two deputy directors general in our market operations area. And it's a pleasure uh, to also welcome you from my side uh, here at the ECB. It's a pleasure to have this conference again in person. Uh, so uh, this morning's session focuses, uh, first session focuses on collateral. And I, I, obviously this is an issue that is, who would, we cannot overstate uh, in terms of its importance for financial markets in the current juncture. We already heard uh, during the Q&A session with, with uh, Mr. Panetta that uh, there is interest uh, in the uh, question of um, collateral scarcity and central bank policies that might help to alleviate that. And the first per, uh, paper in our session looks exactly at this, at this question. It looks at um, central bank facilities to lend securities back to the market to alleviate uh, scarcity and um, assesses uh, quantitatively the effectiveness of these, of these uh, policies. So uh, Stefan Grebmeier and uh, uh, together with his uh, co-author uh, Stefan Yang from the Bundesbank um, have um, uh, prepared this paper that um, Stefan Grebmeier will um, present uh, here today. And the second paper in our on our session uh, on collateral uh, looks at, uh, at the role of collateral in another uh, setting still within the context of central bank policies, namely the role of uh, collateral in banking in backing uh, central bank lending operations, a more traditional role, if you like, uh, for, for uh, collateral in central banking. And uh, on, this, on this topic, um, Pia Hüttel and her co-author Mat Matthias Kaldorf uh, examined the impact that an important change in collateral eligibility rules uh, which, in fact, harmonized uh, collateral eligibility uh, across uh, Eurosystem national central banks, uh, the, the impact that this change had on bank lending behavior. And importantly, this paper traces out also the real effects of this policy change uh, all the way through to uh, the investment and employment uh, decisions of the, the ultimate uh, borrowers. So these are the two, uh, the two papers for this morning's sessions. We start, as I said, with, uh, with a paper on uh, securities lending. And Stefan, uh, the floor is, is yours. The way we will uh, structure the discussions in this session is we will have uh, around 25 minutes for the uh, presentation of the paper. Then uh, Jean-David has kindly uh, agreed to, to discuss the paper for around 10 minutes. And then we'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have uh, around 10 minutes left for Q&A from the floor and from the uh, remote participants. So, Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm just, is there a pointer? Yes. OK, so uh, yeah, thank you for the, for the kind introduction. Um, and a neat summary of the paper. I hope I can add some more on this. Um, thanks for, to the organizers for, for including our paper on the program. Um, that doesn't work. Okay. So it seems like the battery is empty. No. All right. At least, okay. No. <laughs> okay. Let's hope that it, it survives until the end of the presentation. Um, all right, so this is a paper called Securities Lender of, of Last Resort uh, on the causal effect of central banks' securities lending facilities. It's a joint work with um, Stefan Young, a colleague from, from the Deutsche Bundesbank. And since we're both from the Bundesbank, the usual disclaimer applies. These are our views and, and not necessarily the ones from the Bundesbank or the Eurosystem. Um, so this paper, would have probably not been written without quantitative easing, um, since since quantitative easing um, was 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 responsible for making central banks one of, if if not the largest, single owner of of government bonds, and while the the large scale asset purchases that we've seen um, surely help to compress uh, yields on on long term bonds. Um, the fact that, that all those assets then sit on, on the central bank's balance sheet means that they're, they're missing in other places. For example, they're missing in the repo market where, where those high quality assets are often used as collateral. So quantitative easing in, in being or becoming one of the main drivers of collateral scarcity 
um, had, had negative side effects on the functioning of repo markets and, and also second order effects on the functioning of secondary bond markets because market makers in those secondary bond markets uh, rely on well-functioning repo markets in order to, to source collateral um, or, or funding when they want to intermediate in the secondary bond market. So in response to this um, and in order to alleviate those negative side effects, uh, major central banks in, in, um, in the developed economies, so the Fed, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Eurosystem, um, all established um, securities lending facilities as kind of a backstop. So um, it's mainly primar uh, primary dealers that can access those facilities um, when they're looking for a, for a scarce bond or a scarce asset. They cannot locate in the, in the private market. And then they can borrow the bond from the central bank um, and use it in order to support market functioning. So in a nutshell, um, what happened is um, major central banks in, in establishing those facilities became something like the securities lender of last resort. And what we're going to do in our paper is we're going to look at the euro system as one of those securities lenders of last resort. And we're going to um, look at a policy change in the securities lending program. In our case, it's going to be a pricing change, um, a change in the pricing conditions of the facilities. And we're going to use this change in order to understand how the change is transmitted um, to repo and secondary bond markets and whether the, the program works in line with the stated goal. And the stated goal of, of those programs, and this is a, a quote that's directly coming from the, from the ECB's um, homepage, um, so the aim of securities lending is to support bond and repo market liquidity without unduly curtailing normal repo market activity. And this, this quote already gives us kind of like a nice neat guideline um, which dimensions we need to consider in order to, to answer whether the, the programs work effectively, whether the transmission works um, or whether not. So what we're going to look at um, are, are three dimensions we're going to look look at whether the policy change had any effect on the utilization of the securities lending facilities themselves. Then we're going to move one step further and we're going to um, see whether the, the, um, a, a change in the securities lending facilities utilizations also had an effect on, on market participants' normal repo market activity. And here we're going to focus on, on like negative consequences. So did it, did it hurt normal repo market activity or not? Um, and then in the last step, we're going to um, examine whether um, the securities lending facility helps um, to support bond and repo market liquidity. Now, there are already some studies out there on securities lending facilities. There are not too many because those securities lending facilities are a rather novel policy tool. And uh, what these studies uh, usually find um, is that, that higher usage of those facilities is associated with lower scarcity in the repo market. So there's one study by Fleming and co-authors um, for the US case um, some, some time already ago. Um, and there are two more recent studies. Um, one is from colleagues from the Bundesbank. The other one is from colleagues from the Dutch Net National Bank um, who look at um, the securities lending facilities in the euro area. Um, apart from that, um, there's another study um, by, by Pelizzon and co-authors that showed that um, due to the, the lower scarcity that we have, um, thanks to the securities lending facilities, that also helps to improve um, uh, treasury market quality by lowering limits to arbitrage and by allowing um, arbitrageurs to have, have better funding conditions or uh, collateral conditions. Now, what's the challenge that's, that's common to all studies uh, that look at securities lending facilities is that the use of those facilities is, is usually endogenous. So while the scarcity of an asset um, can determine whether I use the facility or not and to what degree I use it, um, the use of the facility itself can then also affect the scarcity of the asset. So there's kind of this reverse causality problem we have here and we need to solve that. And our approach in this paper of how to circumvent this problem is that we're going to exploit a pricing change um, to those securities lending facilities of the euro system. We're going to use it as a natural experiment to really get to the, the causal effects of how those facilities affect repo and, and cash markets. And the second um, thing that's distinguishing our paper from, from the literature is that um, we're going to use 
detailed transaction level data from from um, uh, of the repo market activity of major banks um, so we can directly see how much a bank borrows um, securities from the euro system and then we can also observe um, what happens in terms of securities borrowing and securities lending behavior of those banks um, thereafter so we're really trying to 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 track the whole process we're you know trying to track the transmission of the policy chain uh, policy change throughout the repo throughout the repo market and through uh, the cash market um, so before I go into details here um, let me give you um, some some uh, quick uh, institution institutional background on the securities lending facilities of the euro system so those are implemented in a decentralized fashion which means that each uh, national central bank sets its own rules um, related to counterparty eligibility, collateral eligibility, haircut schedule. Um, this is mainly done to reflect differences in, in domestic market practices since, since repo markets are, are um, to a large part uh, over the counter. Um, what's common to all operations is that securities lending um, from the euro system uh, of the euro system can either take place against securities collateral. Um, so one security is exchanged for another or it can uh, take place against cash collateral. These are the two options. And what's also common um, to all the activities that they are subject to individual counterparty and a global uh, limit in order to, to contain the risks. Um, the most important point here is, however, um, although the securities lending facilities are, are organized in a decentralized fashion, um, there is an overarching pricing framework that should ensure the backstop character of those facilities. And the pricing framework um, is, is exactly the one uh, policy element that we're going to look at. Um, because that one changed um, in November, uh, on November 2nd, 2020. Um, so, so we highlighted the change in, in red here. These are again the two options that we have. So borrowing against securities collateral prior to November uh, 2nd meant that um, you can you can do that against a fixed minimum fee of 10 basis points after or at on November 2nd this was reduced to five basis points so 50 percent reduction um, the cash collateral option was also affected so prior to November 2nd um, you could borrow uh, from the euro system at a, a rate of the deposit facility minus 30 basis points and this spread of 30 basis points was then reduced to 20 basis points after November 2nd. So also a sizable reduction. So in a, in a nutshell, the, the pricing, the change in the pricing uh, schedule we see here made the use of the securities lending facilities of the euro system cheaper. Uh, it, moved, it moved it uh, closer to market conditions. So what we're kind of expecting is that after the pricing change, there should be, there should be more utilization of those facilities. And we can immediately, or we can directly check that with, with data that's available um, publicly on the website. Um, so what you can see here is the, the daily amount of securities that are lent from or borrowed from the euro system um, in the years around the pricing change. So the red line, I don't know if uh, in the middle of the graph, that's the pricing change. Um, the black line is the aggregate amount of securities that are on loan. Um, the blue and the green line are securities collateral and cash collateral, respectively. And you can see that prior to November 2020, um, the, the daily balance um, hovered around uh, 30 to 35 billion. After the pricing change, volumes immediately uh, went up, they sharply increased. Um, and one year after the pricing change, um, securities borrowing amounted to um, an amount of roughly 75 to 80 billion and this amount keeps on increasing um, so the, the use of those facilities is, is still a very common tool um, nowadays. Now in order to, to tease out the causal effects of the pricing change um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a difference in difference approach um, using the pricing change as a, as a shock, as a supply shock, a positive one and then we're going to um, have a, a treatment variable and here the idea is that uh, we're going to argue that securities that are borrowed um, are heterogeneously affected by the central bank induced uh, collateral supply shock. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, split the universe of, of government bonds into bonds with elastic repo market supply and inelastic repo market supply. And the way we're going to do is, is we're going to look at the investor base of each bond 
and we're going to um, argue that some investors are more likely to lend their bonds, whereas other investors are less likely to make their bonds available for lending. In particular, they're less likely to condition their lending decision on, on prevailing market conditions. And the investors that are, that are less likely to do that are, for example, households, non-financial corporations, um, governments uh, or uh, insurance companies and pension funds. So if there's, if there's a lot of um, holdings of the bond going, or if, it, if a lot of uh, one bond is held by those investors, then this bond is likely going to have a, a low supply in the private repo market, which means that market participants in need of those scarce securities are more likely to borrow them from the euro system per se and even more likely to borrow them after the pricing change when, when the use of the facility has become cheaper. So we're going to construct a continuous treatment variable, which is the share of inelastic investor in each bond. And we're going to do that based on, on detailed ownership data. And we can also, we can also back this claim um, in the data. Um, if we plot securities lending volume by different counterparties, then we see that the, the, the investors we term as inelastic are, are indeed the ones that have very low securities lending volumes in the repo market. All right, um, in terms of hypotheses that we want to test, um, as I said, um, our starting point is the policy change. So um, what we have are cheaper borrowing conditions at the Eurosystem securities lending facility. Then in the first step, we're going to um, examine how the use of those um, facilities change around the pricing change. And the expectation is that um, when conditions become cheaper, then there's a higher use. Um, or a higher securities borrowing, in particular for securities that have, that have an otherwise inelastic supply to the repo market. We then move on to overall repo market activity, and here we have two competing views. Um, the first one is the substitution hypothesis, which means that um, if, if banks borrow more from the euro system, then they might um, borrow less from, from pri private market participants, so there's some kind of crowding out taking place which means that if those two effects cancel out, then, then we should see no effect on overall collateral availability and less borrowing from the market. Um, under the second hypothesis, which is the collateral multiplier hypothesis, um, things look a bit different here. The higher use of the securities lending facility translates into a higher overall collateral availability because market participants are going to use the collateral they borrow from the central bank in further repo transaction, they're going to reuse the collateral, which means that overall collateral supply should go up. In the last step, then, we're going to look at effects on the repo and the bond market. And here, the two hypotheses um, are again at play. So under the first one, that's related to the substitution hypothesis. If there's no effect on overall collateral availability, then we should not see an effect on, on uh, overall repo market scarcity and bond market liquidity. Um, if um, the collateral multiplier hypothesis is at work, so an increase in overall collateral availability, then we should see less repo market scarcity and, and a higher bond market liquidity, so improved conditions in both markets. Um, the data we use, um, the main two data sets are, uh, are two data sets from the euro system. So the first one is the, the money market statistical reporting data set, which contains uh, transaction level data of uh, secured money market transactions of the 47 largest Euro area banks, um, we observe both the amount of securities those banks borrow and the amount of securities those banks lend from the euro system, from other market participants, so from other banks that report to the data set, but, but also from, from further uh, counterparties that, uh, uh, that, that don't need to report to the data set. Uh, the second um, data we're using is, is the securities holding statistics. Um, and we're going to use it to construct our main treatment variable. Um, this data gives us um, a, a sectoral decomposition of, of the investor base of each bond. So on a sectoral level, um, at, the, at the quarterly basis, we observe how much of the bond is held by banks, how much is held by insurance companies, and so on and so forth. And as I uh, argued before, we're going to split the investor universe into, into two types of investors, elastic investors that are likely to supply uh, bonds to the repo market, those are monetary financial institutions and investment funds and inelastic investors that are less likely to supply their holdings to the repo market, households, insurance companies, pension <coughs> funds, governments and non-financial corporations. And we kind of borrow this definition from the literature. 
Now, if you if you, if we then start very simple and uh, we simply look at how the how the um, amount of securities borrowed from the euro system changes according to whether the bond is held by a lot of inelastic investors or uh, a lot of elastic investors. So we're splitting the sample in in two parts. Um, we again look at the time around the pricing change. The black line is um, the uh, securities borrowing volume of bonds that have an inelastic investor base. The blue line has an elastic investor base. And we can see that the increase we observe in the public figures is entirely driven um, by securities borrowing of bonds with an inelastic investor base. So those bonds where private repo market supply is low, those bonds after the pricing change are borrowed to a much higher extent from the euro system. Uh, we then do a, a formal test um, of the graph. So we, we uh, set up a difference a difference model um, with the dependent variable being the amount of securities borrowed from the euro system scaled by the amount outstanding of each bond to make things comparable. Um, we first look at one year prior and one year after the change. And we can see that um, if we focus on the first column here, um, in general, that's the post coefficient, um, the securities borrowing from the euro system increased after the pricing change. And in particular, it did so for bonds with an inelastic supply. So that's the, that's the interaction coefficient post times inelastic supply, uh, where we have a highly significant positive coefficient. We then saturate the model with time and bond fixed effects. Um, the coefficient decreases a little bit, but, but stays highly significant. And then we also, we also shorten our event window a little bit um, to eight weeks around the pricing change in order to have, have very few confounding factors that might influence our results. And here we also have a highly significant positive effect. So there's more borrowing from the euro system. Um, in terms of economic significance, uh, what do the coefficients mean? For one standard deviation increase in inelastic supply, um, we're going to have 68% uh, higher um, SLF utilization relative to the period prior to the pricing change. Um, if we then go into the details um, of the um, of the securities lending facility and look at the two different options of how to borrow securities against cash and securities collateral. We see that the effect is roughly equally strong across those two options. If we um, split up borrowing in terms of the repo tenor um, market participants use, we can see that uh, borrowing mainly takes place at, uh, at uh, term repos of one week or longer, which is um, something that we don't observe that frequently in the market itself. Um, all right. How much time do we have left? Five, Five minutes. All right. Um, if we then go to the, to the overall repo market activity, so here we have the same model. Um, we just replace the amount borrowed from the euro system with the amount borrowed from the market. Um, if we look at the overall amount borrowed from the market, the first column, we don't have a significant coefficient, but it's, it's, it's positive. Um, and if we dig a bit deeper, um, we can see some um, nice effects. Um, the total amount borrowed increases, which means that here this is evidence that is rather consistent with the collateral multiplier hypothesis. Market participants seem to use the collateral they borrow from the euro system in further repo market transaction, such that total amount borrowed increases. And we can even um, quantify the collateral multiplier here since we since we scale all our uh, variables by the amount outstanding of each bond and we can directly compare um, the coefficient of what was borrowed from the euro system with the coefficient that's related to the total amount borrowed and the ratio kind of gives us the implied collateral multiplier um, so for one additional unit of collateral that's borrowed from the euro system after the pricing change there are three additional units of collateral overall so the collateral multiplier here amounts to three. If we then again split up repo market activity a bit more um, into the tenors, um, we can see that in contrast to the borrowing from the euro system, which mainly took place at, at term repos of one week or longer, in the market, um, borrowing mainly increases uh, overnight. So there seems to be some kind of maturity transformation along the repo chain. Market participants borrow term, but then in subsequent transaction, we see an increase in overnight borrowing. Um, if we further then, then check some more facts on the collateral multiplier hypothesis, we can see that um, that's, the, that's the first um, three columns that uh, banks do not only borrow more securities, they also lend more securities, which is kind of like a 
condition that needs to be met in order for the collateral multiplier to make sense. And we can see if we consider uh, both the reuse amount, so that's collateral reuse divided by amount outstanding, and the reuse intensity, that's collateral reuse divided by the amount of securities borrowed, um, those two um, variables also increase, um, in particular for, for transactions that are uh, centrally clear. So what we have so far is that um, central uh, market participants borrow more from the central bank after the pricing change. This translates into more collateral availability overall, thanks to the collateral multiplier effect. <coughs> um, if we then look at um, effects on repo market scarcity, um, which we measure by the by the specialist premium, which is the repo rate minus the GC pooling rate. Um, we expect to scar uh, scarcity to decrease, so specialness to decrease, since we have more collateral in the system after the pricing change. So here we have the same model, um, different dependent variables, that's the specialness spread. Um, we look at it for different tenures, overnight, Tom next, and spot next, um, for different data sets in order to check robustness. Um, and Again, we find um, effects that are consistent with our expectation. We find a decrease in the specialness um, of bonds, in particular bonds that have an inelastic um, investor base. Uh, in terms of economic significance, uh, we find that after the pricing change, there is a one basis point reduction in the overnight specialness premium. That's where most of the market borrowing takes place. So that's where most of the effect on rates takes place. Um, and this one basis point decrease is uh, equivalent to a 13% decline relative to the period prior to the pricing change. And last but not least, uh, we look at a bond market liquidity. So given that um, market makers can, can borrow more bonds and they can borrow the bonds more cheaply in the repo market, um, to the extent that they pass on those lower costs to their customers, we should observe a decrease in the bid-ask spread following the pricing change. Um, so we regress the bid ask spread on again the post dummy and the inelastic supply variable, and we can find that uh, there is a re reduction in the uh, bid ask spread following the pricing change. Um, the reduction amounts to uh, 0.6 basis points, uh, which is a 5% relative decline um, relative to the uh, period prior to the pricing change. So also kind of sizable. Um, all right, so let me conclude um, with again um, looking at the quote. Um, that gave us the, the guideline. Um, the aim of securities lending is to support bond and repo market liquidity without curtailing normal repo market activity. What are our insights from the pricing change and how the, how the tool works or, and whether it works effectively? Um, we can see that utilization of securities lending facilities sharply increased after the pricing change, in particular for bonds that are otherwise hard to locate in the private repo market. We do not find strong evidence or no evidence for a substitution effect. Rather, total securities borrowing and lending increases via the collateral multiplier effect, which then leads to improved price, uh, improved conditions uh, in the repo market, lower scarcity, and improved conditions in the treasury market through um, higher bond market liquidity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Jean Devin, yeah. the floor is yours. All right, um, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, letting me discuss this very nice uh, paper. So I'm going to start with a very short uh, summary of the paper and I'll talk about the uh, big uh, picture question here. So what's the research question of this paper? What is the impact of uh, central banks programs of securities lending? And what is the empirical strategy? It's very nice, they exploit heterogeneous exposures uh, to an increase in central banks' uh, securities lending. What do we find? First, uh, they find that there is a positive supply shock, meaning that uh, we have a lower price, lower spaciousness, uh, and higher volume of securities uh, lending. Second main finding of the paper is that uh, the change in policy decreased bid as spreads. That is, it increased liquidity in the underlying uh, markets. Um, they find a lower bid spread, and I'm going to focus um, the discussion on this second finding because I think this is the, um, uh, the future for this, uh, this paper. What is the big uh, uh, picture question here? And um, in the next slide, I'll, I'll motivate why it's important. To me, is the following. 
Does securities lending have an impact or not on market liquidity? And there are two ways um, to answer this. One way is to think uh, about a direct impact. And the direct impact goes as follows. Market makers decrease bid spread when they can borrow easily the securities. That's straightforward to test. This is nice. And second, it's not trivial. And I'm going to give you examples where it can even go the other way. The fact that it's straightforward to test and not trivial is a promising avenue for the paper um, uh, to me. The second way uh, to, to think about this, uh, this question is an indirect impact. As follows, market makers decrease bid as spread when short sellers are able to incorporate negative information by borrowing easily the security. It's a bit complicated to test, and I think it's clearly true based on the literature, so I would not uh, focus on this. Okay, so why should the paper address uh, this question? Well, it's clearly a key question. Um, monetary policy has large impacts on money markets. In turn, money markets impact securities lending. If securities lending impacts securities, this is yet another mechanism where monetary policy can impact uh, market liquidity. So it's clearly an, uh, an, a key question. Second, the, the authors have a better technology to answer this question than the literature. So what the literature has used is quantitative easing. Uh, as an impact to specialness. So basically, the central bank buys a lot of uh, securities. Uh, it makes it uh, harder uh, to, to borrow those securities and specialness increase. The problem is that quantitative easing also have, has a direct impact on the outstanding amount of uh, uh, tradable bonds. So it has an impact uh, on how, uh, how many bonds are available uh, to trade in the market. So quantitative easing has two impacts, on specialness and on the outstanding volumes. So with quantitative easing, one cannot attribute a change in liquidity to specialness. Maybe the change in liquidity comes from the lower uh, tradable volume. But the authors here have an exo exogenous shock, or seemingly exogenous shock, on securities lending only, not on tradable volumes. And that's a much better identification than the literature. And finally, this paper has encouraging uh, first results of beta spread. So why not uh, go, go for it uh, further? So I promise to you uh, that, uh, show you that it's not trivial that specialness impacts liquidity. And that makes it an interesting uh, uh, question. Imagine the following situation. At T0, you have a mid price of 100 euros. The bid price is 25 uh, cents less, and the ask price is 25 cents more. And to facilitate the interpretation, suppose the dealer's inventory at T0 is new. So basically, when a dealer has to sell a security, what, it's, what she's going to do is to borrow the securities on the market and to pay the specialness. So specialness is a cost on the ass side. When the, seed, uh, when the dealers buy the securities, uh, she puts it uh, uh, available for lending and earn the specialness. So specialness is a revenue on the bid side. Suppose that at t is equal to one, the specialness decreases by 10 uh, cents. What happens? This is what is going to happen the bid price is going to decrease by 10 cents because the dealers charges the full decrease in revenue. Fine. But the ask price is also uh, going to decrease by 10 cents because the dealers is going to pass on the full decreasing cost. In the end, there will be no change in bid ask spread. Only the uh, mid price is going to change. And that reflects something that Daryl Duffy in the, in the 90s found, is that specialness represents a stream of income uh, to the holder of the bond. And when this stream of income decreases, the mid price, the fundamental price of the security decreases. 
So in principle, securities lending should not, it's not trivial that it impacts uh, uh, liquidity. And so you need an asymmetry. And sometimes you have the wrong asymmetry and it goes in the opposite direction. Imagine dealers have market power uh, and one can uh, find that securities lending, uh, uh, um, an increase in securities lending will decrease liquidity. With market power, what happens? On the bid uh, side, the same. The dealer is going to charge the full decrease in revenue. But on the ask price, what's, uh, what happens is that the, dealers will be, the dealer will be reluctant in passing on uh, the full decreasing cost. She's going to pass only part of the decrease. So the bid price will decrease by 10 cents, but the ask price only saved by 5 cents. And the bid ask price increases from 50 to 55 cents, liquidity decreased. So for that, you need the right kind of asymmetry. Uh, I don't recommend uh, this kind of model, but for example, if you support short sellers instead of market power, then you would find this. Because for short sellers, short sellers are going to borrow and pay, borrow the security on the, on, on the market and pay the specialness and then sell it uh, to the dealer on the bid uh, uh, side. And if short sellers have market power, they're going to pass on only the decrease in cost, the decrease in specialness to the dealer. And then you're going to find a decrease in, 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 in the bid as spread, an increase in liquidity. Okay? So basically, I don't recommend the, uh, the authors to go for this kind of models. Uh, they're, they're too simplistic. But I would recommend uh, uh, the authors to think about more, uh, more about the conceptual frameworks that link, that uh, would link uh, specialness, okay, securities uh, lending, uh, to uh, market liquidity. I'm going to be short and just um, talk about one other remark. The authors should uh, spell out uh, uh, the shock a bit better. Here's the policy change. Um, uh, here, uh, I give an example for securities lending against collateral. So before the policy uh, change, the lending fee was the maximum between 10 basis points and the market fee. Okay? After the policy change, it was the maximum between 5 basis points and the market fee. But it's unclear that the policy change decreased the cost of borrowing. Imagine the market fee is 15 basis points. Then it's 50 basis points before the policy change and 15 basis points after the policy change. And that leads to a conundrum. For the policy to result in a price uh, shock, the market fee should be sometimes less uh, uh, than five or 10 basis points. But if the market fee is less than five basis points, why not borrowing from the market instead? A potential solution to this conundrum is market breakdown. Uh, so these people borrow from the central bank only when the market breaks down, okay? But is that the case during the policy change? Or adverse selection? The, the, the entities that borrow from the central banks are the entities that, that uh, can only borrow at a very high uh, market fee. And this should be better explained and uh, exploited. If there is adverse selection, is, this is very uh, interesting and you could uh, use it. The other remark is more a, a wish list. Uh, so. What would be nice to have is to test the policy against security uh, for the security against security transactions because you use the uh, MMSR and that would be security against cash uh, transaction. And what you could use is uh, data from market is a bit uh, expensive. So let's see if you have budget, uh, but uh, that would be uh, uh, nice to have. OK, so let me conclude. It's a nice paper with this uh, identification. Um, I would suggest the paper to refocus or, or to devote a large part uh, of the paper to answer a key question. Does specialness have an impact, a direct impact on uh, liquidity? The authors uh, have an advantage to answer it uh, compared to the literature, so they should go for it. There are some efforts needed uh, to develop the conceptual framework that links specialness uh, to market liquidity and to explain and exploit better uh, uh, the, the conditions that lead an entity to borrow securities from the central bank instead of the market. And I look forward to the next version. Thank you very much, Jean-David.
So we're basically right on time, which means that we, we can uh, also take some, uh, some questions from the audience and then perhaps Stefan, you can answer also, uh, including any reactions you may have to the Jean David's comments. So uh, the floor is open also for questions from the audience, also from uh, uh, remote participants. Yes, please. Uh, the, the, the microphone will be brought to you. Yes, thank you. Very interesting paper. Um, I understand you use the MSSR, or the MMSR database. Can you see there a difference also uh, in the database itself? Is it all uh, specials and single names? Or uh, is there also uh, data on uh, on GC trades in there? And also, um, in the in the usage of the lending facility, can you see the difference between whether or not it's been used only particularly for bonds that were special and had a pricing interest to be used in the lending facility? Or was there also usage of uh, GC for providing liquidity to the markets in terms of uh, uh, collateral scarcity? Um, yeah, so so um, there is no like indicator in the MMSR that tells us what is a special trade and what is a GC trade. However, um, given that you know there's this, we're we're working in, a, in an env environment of, of huge excess liquidity. Um, there are um, estimates out that, that say that around 90% of all MMSR transactions are related to special repos. Um, which means that we're kind of leaving the GC side apart and um, assume that the, the main motive for an, foreign market participants also to, to um, get in touch with the euro system is, is uh, related to collateral motives and not funding motives. Um, so we cannot directly distinguish it. However, I think it's a reasonable assumption to say that, that the overwhelming majority of the trades we, we see in, in either case is related to special repos. Yep. Andrew, please. Thanks. Um, if I understand your paper correctly, it's sort of framed in terms of deltas. You know, what happens if a change here affects a change there? But um, many of our markets at the moment have really high levels uh, of gap between, I don't know whether you want to do sort of bond swap spreads or whatever metric you want to use. So how can we use your paper at all to understand how to get closer to the optimal level as opposed to the delta, which of course is the big policy question we're all facing, or does the paper not really help with that? Thanks. So I'm not sure if I, if I fully understood the questions, but the, the, so the, at least the results we're showing um, in terms of specialness and so on, it's on levels. So we see that it's indeed the level that decreases of specialness. Um, going closer to the optimal level would mean that we need a guess on what the optimal level is. Um, we certainly don't don't provide that guess. Um, I think what's what's what was our what at the heart of our paper is really to to understand how you know twisting one of the policy parameters of such a novel policy tool um, how that transmission then. Uh, works throughout the repo and bond market. Um, whether it helps us to get closer to an optimal level or not, um, it's not the main part of the of the research question. I think it's more about the mechanics of how such facilities work. Okay. Thank you. Let's take one more question over here, please. Thanks for the interesting uh, presentation and the paper. Uh, as you distinguish between elastic and inelastic investors, I was wondering how you deal with uh, foreign investors, so outside the euro area, given that for Boons we know that quite a big share is held by uh, foreign official institutions, I think, and they are quite inflexible as well. But those are not included in SHS to the extent that I know, so... Yeah, that's right. So the foreign investors are not included, although they are a major investor group um, in, the, in the government bond space. Um, so uh, what, what we do is um, we kind of, first of all, follow, follow prior literature, uh, which puts foreign investors into the, the group of elastic investors. Um, um, yeah, so we, we treat foreign investors. So in the SHS, we treat it as the residual between, you know, the amount we can 
uh, attribute to each sector and the amount we cannot attribute. This is then the foreign sector. For our definition of the variable, the foreign sector goes into the elastic investor part. Um, probably we basically also assuming that a, a large part of those foreign investors might be, again, monetary financial institution active in the repo market, which would then be the elastic investors. Yeah, so those are elastic. El elastic yeah. As a pertinent question, also knowing that uh, some sovereign wealth funds uh, outside the euro area are big holders of uh, of these uh, securities and indeed also active in securities lending, albeit episodically. I believe there was also another question here more to the front. Um, yeah, thank you. I think it was um, very much along the lines of the question that we were just discussing, so maybe it fits well. Uh, so I was wondering who are which bonds do those inelastic bondholders hold and do they have a preference and does that have a, a role for your result? Uh, we would need to check that, whether there's, there's cross-sectional differences in, in, in which kind of, of bonds elastic and inelastic investors hold. Um, so ex ante, I cannot think of, of one. Um, but yeah, that yeah might be something we need to check whether there's there's some systematic difference in in the bonds they hold, um, which might explain our results. Yeah, well taken. So I, I I'm not sure we have any further questions, but I'd like to give you also some time, uh, Stefan, to get back to if you like if uh, any reactions you you may have to Jean David's comments. Sure. Um, yeah. So thanks for the thanks for the discussion. Uh, very insightful. I think that's uh, the the the. Um, the part about the, the liquidity. So we're still thinking about the, the really big picture question that we want to address because, you know, leaving it like this might be a, a very specific topic. Um, so that might be a, a good way to, to, to go for the future. Um, we're still and at the moment working on, on more dimensions of, dimensions of market quality to kind of leave up that part of the paper. Um, we haven't really thought about the, the, the micro linkages the direct and indirect impact of, of liquidity. So that kind of is a, is a bit, it needs, it needs more work. Um, so we, we will surely think about the, the, your ideas. Um, yeah, apart from that, um, so I, I mean, we do have a model in mind if, uh, when we talk about uh, what links liquidity and specialness, um, that's uh, one by uh, Infante and who. Um, so that it's related to your thoughts, but I think yours go a bit, bit further in, in bringing in this asymmetric impact. So that's, that's a really interesting thought. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it with that. Uh, I definitely need to think much more about, about uh, the discussion before giving, giving quick answers. But yeah, very much appreciate it. Okay, and with that, uh, we're right on time. So many thanks to both for being disciplined and for the very interesting um, presentations. And many thanks for, for the questions. And um, yeah, uh, let me invite you all to, to thank Stefan and Jean-David. Jean thank you very much.